please. If you have your Bible with you, or if you want to use that one that's in front of you, I want you to turn to the book of James again today. James is way almost near the end of your Bible there. It's a relatively short letter, I'll remind you, that James uh, is the name of the author of this letter. Uh, and he's writing to some people that need to be reminded of something. And if you've been here over the last few weeks, it's a pretty simple concept. He's saying that if you have faith, then there ought to be some deeds or some works or some things that you do to go along with that faith. I closed last week's message from the passage that we're going to read the whole passage again. Last week we kind of looked at the first half of it. This week we'll look at the second half of it. But a guy named J.I. Packer coined this phrase, What saves us is faith, but faith that saves is never alone. Um, it's been repeated in different versions of that, that salvation is by faith alone. We don't earn our way into heaven, but faith that saves never is alone. There's always something that follows it, obedience and doing and being what God wants us to be. And that's why it's such an important concept, but it's a pretty simple concept, and yet for so many people, so often, a lot of us have trouble with the follow-through on that. And evidently that's not been a rare case, not in James's day, not in our day, and even somewhere in between. I read this week that the 19th century philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, you may know that name from existentialism. Um, unfortunately, I had a lot of philosophy classes as part of my training and didn't always benefit from it, but I think this gets at the essence of Kierkegaard was like a lot of people in Christian circles over many, many centuries were he noticed that there was what we called last week a yawning chasm between what we profess and what we do, between our faith and our works. Um, and this is the story he tells to illustrate that. And I bet you've heard some version of this story and maybe didn't know that it came from 19th century philosophy. But he told the story about duck land. And it was Sunday morning, and all the ducks dutifully came to church in Duckland, waddling through the doors and settling down in, uh, in the aisles and in their pews where they comfortably squatted. When all were settled, the hymns were sung. The duck minister waddled to his pulpit, opened the duck Bible, and read, Ducks, you have wings, and with wings you can fly like eagles. You can soar into the sky. Use your wings. It was a marvelous and elevating duck scripture and thus all the ducks quacked their assent with hearty amen. And they plopped down from their pews and all waddled home. And I forgot to give you up here if you needed a visual aid for that. <laughs> there they are, waddling in and waddling out. They hear and can agree uh, that we could fly like eagles, but don't always follow through with it. And so that yawning chasm between what we say and even what we agree to and what we actually do and what we are is sort of at the center of what James is going to get at again today. So let's read again. These are the same verses we read last week, but I want to concentrate this week on the last six or seven verses. So hear with me again the word of the Lord. This is from James chapter 2 and we'll begin at verse 14. This is what James has to say to us. Hear God's word. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds, show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds." You believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together 
and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body Without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. May God bless his word for us today. My favorite part of that passage that we just read, if you have your Bible open, in fact, keep your Bible open. I want you to look in a couple of other places in just a minute. But my favorite part of this, because it reminds me of something that happened throughout my childhood, is in verse 20. It says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? He's saying, do you need proof of this? The first half of this, the case that we made last week, is that faith is never alone. That if your faith doesn't have deeds to go along with it, it's either dead faith, that's really not faith at all, or simply demon kind of faith, that even the demons believe something about God, but it's not saving faith. Saving faith, although it saves us by itself without adding works to it, it always has the works to go along with it. And so when I was a kid, there was this expression that friends in my neighborhood used often. Um, And it was simply this, you want to bet? And whatever you said, if there was any kind of disbelief in it, you could say, you want to bet. Now, it didn't have nothing to do with gambling. There was no wager involved. It was what the translation of you want to bet was, just wait right there and I'll show you. In fact, if you could say, I could throw a rock all the way over that fence over there. No, you couldn't. You want to bet? What followed? Well, let's pick a rock up and I'll show you. Or I can beat you from here to that telephone pole in a race. No, you can't. You want to bet? There's no money exchange, no wager to be had, but there was evidence needed to be provided. And I like the fact that James is simply saying here that faith without deeds is dead, is no faith at all. And he says to these people, you foolish person, he's talking to this hypothetical person who's foolish enough to say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. He says, you want to bet? Let me show you. And so he uses two examples, and I want to leave this up here for you. He uses the example of Abraham and of Rahab. He could not have picked two more different people, and I think he did it on purpose. That he wants to say, let me give you two just polar opposite people that God has used to demonstrate that deeds always follow faith. Now the first might be the obvious choice. James is writing to what is widely believed to be a mostly Jewish audience. And I share with our Bible study this week on the book of Galatians, Paul uses the same person when he's dealing with Jewish ideas. You pick the most Jewish of all Jewish people. You pick Father Abraham, the guy who started it all. He's the godfather of all Jewishness. And so he says, let's go back to the beginning. And let me show you how faith and deeds have to go together. So in Genesis 15 and Genesis chapter 22, and we'll look briefly at those in just a minute, he picks the patriarch, the godfather of all Jewish people. One that James calls in verse 23, a friend of God. He's a great leader. In fact, he was a military leader. He was a political leader. He was a man of influence in his world in all kinds of ways. He was at the top of the social order in many ways. He was almost a king-like figure. And then there's Rahab. We read about her in Joshua chapter 2. Uh, the scriptures tell us she was a prostitute. She was among the enemies of God, so she was at the very bottom. Really, to say she's a common citizen is really not even all that ac- accurate. She was much less than a common citizen. She would be at the bottom of the social order, living inside a city that was a literal enemy of God that the Israelite army was about to attack. He couldn't have picked 
two different people, but I think James picks them to say God can use all kinds of people in all kinds of places from all kinds of backgrounds to demonstrate this. Once real saving faith comes to a person, action always follows. Abraham was moral. She was immoral. He was the original Jew. She was a Gentile woman outside of the chosen people of God. He was upwardly mobile, we might say today, and she lived in the gutter. Both had towering faith, we're told, that led them to do mighty and great things. But the common denominator was the faith that proved itself as genuine by their works. What they believed determined their behavior. And in short, that one sentence is really what James is all about. That our belief has to lead to behavior that demonstrates that belief or it's no belief at all. Faith without deeds is dead. Faith without deeds is useless. Faith without deeds is no faith at all. So let's look at these two people very briefly. First of all, let's look at Abraham. If you still have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 15. Now Abraham was a complete stranger in all history. God chose this man. In fact, the Bible will tell us in certain places, not because he was anybody. In fact, maybe just the opposite. He chose him because he was nobody. And he was living among pagan, idolatrous people. And God says, I'm going to choose you as my man. Now get up and go to the place that I tell you. And miraculously, Abraham does. And along the way, God comes and gives this promise to him. This is what we read in Genesis chapter 15. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram, as he was known at the time. The ham was added later to the end of his name. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great Reward, But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, The man will not be your heir, but a son who is of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Many of you already know this, that Abraham was well advanced in years and really didn't think that he was going to have this child. In fact, this isn't really a complaint to God necessarily. It's just a statement of fact is, God, I'm not going to have an heir, so how could my family be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And yet verse 6 in chapter 15 says this, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. That's the very first time in the whole Bible that the word believed is used in reference to the Lord. There's a sense in which in that moment faith began to grow in Abram's heart. And lots of things that happen uh, after this, sometimes it seems like shaky faith, but it's faith nonetheless that God, that Abraham already really at this point has trusted God in leaving his home and going to a different place. And he's going to have to trust God on a number of things in years to come. But Abram believed God. He had faith. Well, how do we know that he had real faith? In fact, we could read some stories in between chapter 15 and chapter 22, and you're like, I'm not sure Abram really has all that much faith. But I would make a case to you, the Bible wants us to know that he had genuine faith, and here's why. And this is the example that James points us to. And it has to do with that promised son that God had just told him about. His name was Isaac. So if you flip over to chapter 22 in Genesis, this is what we read. Uh, and some 30 years or so may have transpired between the promise and this 
point in time. Abram has been given this son that was promised to him. His name is Isaac. And probably by now, sometimes in our picture Bibles and things, we picture Isaac being this small child being led by the hand. In all likelihood, he might have been a, a, a middle teenager, maybe even into young adulthood. Lots of years have gone by. And this is what it says, chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Do you remember what James said about being tested at the beginning of this book? Consider it pure joy when you go through those kinds of things because God is using it for your benefit and that often God's tests are not to see if we have faith, but it's to prove our faith. It's to demonstrate our faith. And so the testing is not just to see if we belong to God. It's an opportunity to demonstrate our faith in Jesus Christ. So God says to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you an unimaginable request from God. But listen to the reaction. Early the next morning, Abraham, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then, and don't miss this word, we will come back to you. Do you see faith at work in there? Lots of people go, I could never do that, and I'm one of them. If God asks that of me, how could I possibly even imagine following through with such a request? But what do we see in Abraham's faith? I know what God has promised, and so whatever transpires here, I know God's not going to go back on his promise. He promised me a son. In fact, God is specific. He promised me this son, Isaac, and so whatever happens here, we're going to go up there. I'm going to be willing to do what God is asking me to do, but we are coming back. His faith is in action. So we won't read all of the story, but they go up to the hill. He ties his own son up, raises a knife to carry out what God has told him to do and is stopped by an angel of the Lord and says, don't lay a hand on that boy. Verse 10 tells us that he reached out his hand, took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. You see how his faith is proven. It's tested but it's shown to be genuine faith that hears what God says, knows what it knows about God, even against all human reason in a certain way of looking at it. Abram, Abraham here is willing to go forward with God, what God has called him to do. How could Abraham do that? How could he have faith that says, we'll be back here? Well, Hebrews, and you don't have to turn there, but chapter 11 is uh, kind of the hall of fame of faith. And this is what it tells us about Abraham in that moment. It says, by faith, when God tested him, offered Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And listen to this, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Here's a man that says he believed God. Now, he believed it in a time when maybe it was easy because God was promising something good to him, but his faith over those 30 years had grown into something that was willing and able to trust God when it didn't make a lot of human sense. In fact, we would say this. Verse 22 says it for us in James chapter 2 that we read. You see, his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. So if maybe 30 years 
transpired between chapter 15 and chapter 22, when did Abraham have faith? I believe he had faith way back in chapter 15 when the promise was made, and yet he had 30 years of testing and proving that faith that when it came time to demonstrate it, he was willing to put it into action. In fact, I think a principle could be said for us, the more we obey God, the more our faith grows up. There's lots of application for that in our everyday lives is if we can start by obeying and believing God in the small ways, then when it comes to the big storms of life, maybe those are the places where our faith can be shown to be genuine because it's become a habit, a lifestyle, a culture in our own life where I trust God. I trust God at His good promises and I trust, I trust God in the difficult circumstances in life. Now, what about in some very common ways? What about even our attendance at something like this once a week? Aren't we demonstrating some kind of small faith in that way is to say there is something worthwhile for me to get up and to attend a church service on a Sunday morning that I'm taking God at his word that says don't give up meeting together, that it's good to come into the house of the Lord and that it's good for us to lift up the name of Jesus together. So then in more difficult times in our life when we don't feel like attending worship. Our faith has already informed us. Our faith has already demonstrated that there's an important aspect to it that will genuinely grow us up. To complete our faith or bring it to maturity is one of the translations of that. That faith, the more we obey, the stronger it grows. We can see that even in our own, uh, maybe our prayer and our Bible study time. Many of us find it hard to do in our everyday life. It just doesn't seem that I can carve out much time to do that. And when I do, I seem so distracted and so uh, difficult to stay in the moment of it. Well, does our faith say that I do something, that I start with it? And if I begin it as a habit and a lifestyle and a culture in my own life that begins to develop, I see it grow and I see it deepen to where God shows me more and greater things over and over I hope you see that in the care for the poor and the helpless. James has mentioned that in the first half of the passage that we read. The more we are able to meet the needs of other people, the stronger our faith becomes to see the importance of doing that. I would even say to you in uh, the course of your uh, everyday participation in the life of the body of Christ that using our gifts, I hope, will be the same. The title I gave to this sermon was Faith Puts Me to Work. I hope that you find small ways to serve in which it begins to grow up and your faith begins to be informed and strengthened and grown into a way where you can serve in all kinds of ways and all kinds of things. And we don't live in fear that that's not really my thing or that's not what God's called me to. As I see an opportunity, if I'm able to meet it, I do it in big things and in small things. Faith is not believing something uh, in spite of evidence, some people think faith is this thing that I believe something even though it doesn't seem true. In fact, one person said faith is more like obeying in spite of consequences. Faith tells me I'll do what God says, then I don't care what the outcome is. That's an Abraham kind of faith. And it only makes sense. Did you see the winner of the lottery this week? 700 and something million dollars. She said what everybody says that wins. When I first saw the numbers, I could not believe it. But I am 100% certain at some point she was convinced she was the winner. How do I know that? Because I saw her holding that big old check. At some point, she didn't say, I can't believe it. And so she threw the ticket away. At some point, she began to think, this is real, and so I need to do something. Now, she, a lot of people might make the case she's ruined her life now, but she did something that proved that she believed that was the winning ticket. Now, maybe in more serious cases, all those cars that came streaming out of southeast Texas uh, over the last few days, why did they do that? Because they believed that the forecast was accurate and it was not a good place to be. And lots of people moved. They acted in regards to what they knew to be true. So that's Abraham. We spent much more time. Very quickly, Rahab, this prostitute, 
the circumstances of her faith is this. She comes from a whole different point. She doesn't have years and lifetime of experience to call upon, and yet we see real faith in this woman. Here's the situation. The people of God are now being given the promised land. This is generations after Abraham. They've been away in Egypt in slavery. God miraculously saves his people out of that. They wander around in the desert for 40 years because of their disobedience. And now the moment has come. And spies are sent in. The very first city that they're going to take is Jericho. And that's where this woman lives. And some spies sneak into the city and they find themselves in the basically the in or the rooms that this woman of ill repute rents out and now their lives are threatened. The king finds out their spies there and he begins to look for them and when he comes to inquire at Rahab's house, did these men stay with you? Where are they? She says, yes, they were here but I sent them away. And what sent them away means I hid them under a pile of straw while your men were looking around and then when they left I let them down through a window outside. And this is her words uh, to these spies. She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you have fallen on us that is the enemies of God, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites out um, east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. You see the faith that she immediately has? I heard what happened. I, we've seen with our own eyes and we've heard the news about your God. And I'm here to say today, your God is the God and we bow down before him. Or at least I do. How do we know she really meant that? Because she put her own life in jeopardy to hide these men. You see, faith put her to work, that this kind of scandalous grace, uh, a grace that given from God that's available to prostitutes who's an enemy of God who is at the bottom of the social order is the same grace that produces the same faith as it does for a man like Abraham. And how do we know both were genuine? Because they both offer risky obedience. Abraham and Rahab both put their life and everything dear to them on the line for the Lord. They trust him without hesitation, qualification, or reservation. Faith puts me to work, I hope, is your understanding. And faith that does not put you to work is really no faith at all. Hebrews 11, and I'll close with this, uses all these kinds of action Words. I don't want you to turn there. Just listen to the kinds of things that faith produced in God's people over many, many years. This is at the end of that chapter. He's listed people like Moses and Abraham and even Rahab is listed in this list. And then he comes to kind of to a summary statement. This is uh, Hebrews chapter 11 beginning with verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, uh, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who, and listen to this description, through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead and raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about it. In, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. Can you see how fate? puts people to work. Now you might think, I could never do any of those things. I'm never going to make the hall of fame. 
Well, I would say to you today, how does your faith grow up to do things like that, those mighty acts to defeat armies and lions and face death and destitution and all kinds of things with that kind of faith? Well, it starts with something small today. Trust God today and let your faith grow up like Abraham and Rahab and let God use you for great and mighty things. And when I say let your faith grow up, what I mean today is do something. Don't just stand there. Do something. Every one of us surely has some opportunity to serve God in our lives today. If you don't think you do, come see me. i got a long list of them you can do right here at First Presbyterian Church. But I bet a lot of you can do that at home, at your place of work, with your neighbors, in your own extended family. There's all kinds of places in which we do it. So let your faith put you to work in doing what God has called you to do. And do it today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is gracious, uh, who has saved us by your grace. And I pray that our faith, Uh, that's a product of the grace given to us, would grow up in us this day, that you would open our eyes to see the opportunities that we have to serve you, to love people around us, to give ourselves for the cause of Christ. And I pray that you would do that in us today uh, in some small way so that soon it grows up uh, to be used in some big uh, and mighty way. And we can know that you'll do that in us and through us, and so we trust you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen.